Wow. Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Thanks for tuning in once again. Today we're going to go over some more uh, old newspaper articles, some amazing finds uh, and reports that they never really told us about. Things they're hiding, things they never taught us in school, things that would change history. Also, I have a lot of books that I actually been holding for years. I haven't even read them to you guys. And I want to start reading uh, little by little, you know, the, each chapter, really good books. And it's right on time because it's it's things they found here in America, things that, that was never reported, things that was never talked about, just like these newspaper articles, um, more specific, you know, they go into it more specific. So we're going to get into uh, the first chapter, one of those books today. And also, we got a little special here on the history of masonry. I'm going to show you where it really originated. Yeah, masonry. It was here in America. You already know. All right, pura vida, let's get started. A long time. So I got a lot of books, actually, guys, we're going to get into. So I've had this in my Kindle library for a while. It actually complements the recent videos uh, with the old uh, newspaper clips from Analog and the Twitter page. You know, a lot of stuff they found here, as it says here. The lost worlds of ancient America, compelling evidence of ancient immigrants, lost technologies and places of power. Edited by Frank Joseph, forward by John De Salvo, PhD. All right, we're going to go to chapter one here. And it says here, California's Buried Altar and Monument to the Great Flood by Frank Joseph. It says here, the recent and dramatic find of a foreign pre-Columbian artifact in Western America is also among the most convincing of its kind ever made. The stone block's discovery under conditions beyond all possibilities of fraud, plus the nature of its identity, represent a truly revealing discovery. Not very far away, another monolith is inscribed with one of the largest, most complex examples of rock art. Both objects are clues to the mysterious prehistory of the Golden State. All right. The very interesting information here, something they found in California. Again, going well with what we've already gone over uh, about California, very ancient land. We all know that. So we're going to see what they found over there. Shortly after the turn of the 21st century, an old house was being torn down in a western neighborhood of Los Angeles, California. After its demolition, workers began digging up the backyard in preparation for a new construction. At five feet beneath the surface, their shovels struck something unexpectedly bulky and solid. Persistent excavation brought to light a sculpted monolith, 3.4 feet tall, with a base measurement of 1.7 by 1.6 feet. The reddish igneous block is almost perfectly rectangular in shape, weighs 228 pounds, and shows the effect of having been buried in acidic soil for many centuries. All right, they found this artifact here, this monolith, and you hear what they're saying? It's been buried there for many centuries. Abstract lines and semicircles identically cover either side while more than halfway up the broader front, the likeness of a human head partially emerges from the center in bas relief, surrounded by engraved ridges, suggesting a hairstyle terminating below the head in large twin curls. The oblate facial features are carefully molded, although details are sparse. Small eyes and mouth are depicted, with possible remnants of a nose and a brow. These carvings resemble nothing similar to indigenous Californian or even North American tribal imagery. They are utterly unlike anything found in Native American art, either prehistoric or contemporary. Indian material culture did not include monumental stone sculpture. All right, so this is what they're talking about here, guys, okay? They found this buried, and it's a century, centuries old. After a Cursory examination during a recent exhibition at the Public Broadcasting System's well-known Antiques Roadshow, all right, PBS, television program, an appraiser archaeologist could offer no opinion, save that the large object, judging from its soil stains, was at least 500 years old, but probably much older. Curators from the Archaeology Department of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles have not been able to add anything to the appraiser's limited assessment although they did not question the unique artwork's pre-Columbian provenance. Its precise age, original purpose, 
significance of its illustrated surface or identity of its creators escaped them. Owners of the monolith shared what little they know of their accidental find with ancient American on conditions of personal anonymity and privacy concerning the undisclosed whereabouts of their discovery. It must forever remain an unsoluble mystery, so long as mainstream scholars restrict their investigation within the borders of pre-Columbian North America. In the light of the outside world, however, the artifact stands revealed. Its full face, sculpted relief with stylized headdress and crude, though effective execution, finds its close likeness in the ancient old world deity, all right? This is the true old world. It's what they're finding here. Beginning with the mid-16th century BC, the Phoenicians began to assert their separate identity and emerge from the other Semitic peoples of Canaan, a kingdom roughly corresponding to the region encompassing modern-day Israel. I dodged the hijack. It's not over there. That ain't the promised land. We've already gone over the information. If you knew, make sure to catch the previous presentation. It's been five years here. It's been a long journey. We're still learning. All right. So that's the hijack right there about that Israel, Palestine, and all that stuff. All right. And then he's going to say the Lebanese are descendants of Phoenicians. Well, maybe, maybe not. Well, you know, it's kind of generalizing, but who's the Phoenicians? All right. We're eventually going to get to that. So then they go on talking about since they had the cedars of Lebanon, right? It's the biblical ones. Supposedly they, that's where they built the ships and that's why they went all around the world. But we already know. We already know, right? We got the videos already. We know. The gopher tree and all this stuff they're using the cedars these big cedars where these trees are coming from already we could write the navigational videos how big these ships were cut out of one single tree okay fitting 150 people talking about cedars of lebanon right place of whiteness right so dodge the hijack with all this africa part and uh over there in mediterranean middle east you know their their fake locations so continuing the second paragraph right here, it says, Among the Phoenicians' most beloved deities was Ashtar, their version of the much earlier Sumerian Inanna. She was the divine patroness of both fertility and war, life and death. Twin aspects embodied her celestial light, the planet Venus, rising in the east as the morning star and setting in the west as the evening star. 11th century BC, Phoenician cosmologist Saint Shuniaton portrayed her as the mighty one wandering through the world an appropriate conception for the far-ranging phoenicians whose sailors prayed to her as our lady of the sea all right do you hear that so they're trying to correlate something here so they're teaching you about this diet is phoenician diet because that's what they found here in california that's what they're going to tell you you'll see when they arrived in egypt as traders and settlers what egypt the real egypt right over here the nile what Egypt? Egypt is a Greek word. Temple of Pita or the Temple of Pata. Menis, Memphis, Memphis, on the now Mississippi, on the Mississippi, the Great River. Okay, so let's not get sidetracked when they say when they arrived in Egypt as traders and settlers. Ashtar was welcomed as a popular import by their host, assuming some features of an indigenous goddess. Hathor, particularly her iconic headdress, with his bouffant configuration ending in two close fitting curls on either side of the head. Thereafter, Ashtar was usually portrayed wearing the stylized headdress wherever the Phoenicians traveled, as evidenced by one of their bronze figures of the goddess from Carranzo, Spain. The Egyptians worshipped her as Kadashu during the 18th and 19th dynasties from 1550 until 1200 BC. What Egyptians are the Tamarians, Tamari? When the two peoples had a falling out, a prayer to Ashtar Kadashu found in Egypt at a Phoenician burial was probably a standard text dedicated to the deity whenever she was venerated. Praise Lady of the Stars of Heaven, Mistress of all gods, may she grant life, welfare, prosperity, and health. Mayest thou grant that I behold thy beauty daily. All right, that's what it said supposedly on the tablet. Although the countenance protruding from the Los Angeles monolith wears a hat or headdress, it does not belong to that Egyptian goddess or Kadashu because neither deity was ever so cruelly depicted in the Nile Valley. Phoenician divinities, on the contrary, were often coarsely portrayed, such as the 
photograph example included here from 8th century BC, Hadrumetum, a Phoenician colony in Tunisia, North Africa, or Ashtart engraved image, its resemblance to the California figure. Wholly unlike any other representation of this god, is unmistakable, okay? You hear that? It's, it's basically the same, he's saying. Moreover, the face forward style was diagnostic of Phoenician sculpted art, all right? This is what they're finding in California. So this is a stone representation of Phoenician goddess Ashtar from Hadrumetum, North Africa, 800 BC, supposedly, right? And this is the one they found in Los Angeles, the monolith. Now, you see the headdress that goes down right here? This is what they're talking about. And the eyes, very... All right, you see, like, the head. They say headdress. It looks like hair to me, but the same with the eyes, right? With the decline of Egyptian and Mycenaean Greek influence on the Aegean world, after the 13th century BC, the Phoenicians were free to exploit the rest of the Mediterranean Sea and beyond throughout the Atlantic realm where colonies were established in western Morocco and Iberia. They are known to have brought back oranges from Canary Islands together with a costly purple dye, the Purpura Murex, found in a rare sea sh snail shell from Madeira. And they left a hoard of coins on the even more remote Azor Island of Corbu. The Los Angeles monolith is physical proof they sailed further. All right, so I just want to go ahead and stop there just to get you guys a reference. Because I know they keep trying to tell us that Phoenicians are coming from a fake holy land. All right, so let's just overstand that. And so where's the true promised land? Where is Canaan, the true promised land, the terrestrial paradise? Let's not forget. The Phoenicians were coming out of here. That's why you find statues like this here. They've seen it in reverse. Yeah, they went over there to Iberia and Morocco. Yes. And not just there, but the Ireland or the Irie, I Emerald Islands, right? The British Islands. All right, future video. Again, we're going to go over this. I'm going to break this down. So just start the hijack with the false orientations they're trying to give us, right? All right. So they're saying they went all the way to Los Angeles. Well, they were. Of course, they were all the way over here. That's right next to Judah. <laughs> Utah, like other objects of its kind, the sculpted block confirms in size and rectangular cubic shape to a stone altar for the worship of Ashtar, the Lady of the Sea, who safely brought Phoenician visitors to the west coast of our continent more than 2,000 years ago. So they're seeing it in reverse again. Another and we are waking up with analog. We're back in the brothers' page right here to get some more incredible finds here, some more incredible newspaper reports, old ones that they never showed us, things they never talked about, things that could really rewrite history and prove that America is the true old world. So let's get right into it again. Here we go. We start with this one right here, Prehistoric Masonry from Arizona, 1896. It says here, Prehistoric Masonry, relics that have been unearthed, engraved with Masonic, emblems masonic emblems you hear this that masonry is of ancient origin there can be no doubt but history does not state that masonry existed among the aztecs or toltecs the prehistoric tribes that thousands of years in the dim past flourish in arizona it is true that scientists have been able to collect but little knowledge of these extinct tribes for the only reliable evidence of the prehistoric existence of the races buried in the oblivion of ages are the relics that from time to time have been unearthed in the mounds, strewn over the valley and territory. These ruins in themselves are indisputable and proven that at one time a tribe of a fair degree of intelligence inhabited the country, all right? But the reason of the total destruction of the tribes is purely guesswork. Although many plausible conjectures have been advanced, the length of time that the race inhabited the country, of course, is unknown, right? They don't know. So it's been guesswork all the time. They've been telling you, right? Bearing straight theories and all this other stuff. They don't really know. Those are all theories. It can only be supposition at the most that the people always lived here. All right? The people always lived here. It can just as easy be supposed, right? That the people were already here. You've been here. Or were a nomadic tribe that settled here. The latter being thought very probable. 
At any rate, there are evidences that masonry existed and it is a matter for scientists to worry over. 17 years ago, Bud Cummins of Tempe and another gentleman made a partial excavation of one of the numerous mounds near that city and were greatly surprised when they unearthed a seashell on which was worked in perfect relief a square and a compass. The shell had evidently been worn as a charm around the neck as a hole was through the shell. The relic was subsequently presented to Dr. Thibodeau, formerly of this city, who prizes it very highly. John Tate, superintendent of the Orange Orchard, is greatly interested in prehistoric relics and is always seeking to add to his collection. About a year ago, he was in the Indian village east of the city for the purpose of collecting relics from the Indians. He met a squaw and after hard work made her understand what he was seeking. She entered her habitation and from the ground dug up an old olla or a pot filled with ornaments both prehistoric and the handiwork of their tribe. The ornaments were attached to a string and looking them over, Mr. Tate's attention was riveted on a small charm of red sandstone on which was plainly engraved the square and compass. He purchased the relic and it is the most valued of his collection. A prominent mason a short while ago offered him a fabulous price for the emblem, but he would not part with it. All right, so even a mason came over to him and said, yo, I want to buy that. Mr. Tate also has in his possession a Masonic keystone, which he bought from a Maricopa Indian. All right, a Masonic keystone from the Maricopa Indians. The peculiarity of the latter relic is that no one has ever been able to tell from what it is made, though of undoubtful Masonic significance. J.C. Dyer of this city at one time had a valuable collection of prehistoric relics, which he disposed of. Among the collection was an accurate Masonic plume, which is now in the possession of Mr. Tate. Masonry beyond a doubt existed in the earliest ages and some writers maintain that it derived its origin from the Dionysic Fraternity, an association which was formed in Asia Minor by the architects and builders engaged in the construction of the temples at a time when the Greeks migrated from Athens. The association is supposed to have been in existence entire when Solomon undertook the building of the temple and the story runs that the fraternity sent a band of workmen from Tyre to assist in that work. Freemasonry, all right, those are Phoenicians, all right, Phoenicians did build the temple of Solomon. He had them help him. The Phoenicians, so-called Phoenicians from Tyre, these people from Tyre helped build Solomon's temple. Freemasonry, according to this account, is said to have been originally organized by the leaders of the band. And in this way, it's explained the great prominence which is given to Solomon's temple in the rituals and symbols of the order. Writers, however, differ as to the origin of masonry, but well-informed masons content themselves with supposing that the order originated in the association which were formed of the Middle Ages by masons and builders. All right. So again, much, much older than that. All right. And we know the origin of this. I'm going to show you guys right after this. All right. This is in the next page. It starts right here. It says, but was originally founded by Ashfall and some of his friends as a piece of mystification. Its symbols and signs haven't been borrowed partly from the Knights Templars and partly from the Rosicrucians. The square and compass may be a comparative modern origin as an emblem of the order. Certain it is that they are tools used in the present age, but the findings of these prehistoric relics in the ancient Aztec ruins have a significance. It is not presumed, however, that the Aztecs were of African or Asiatic origin. They're not, right? They're not. They're from here. But to take the ruins of the vast waterways, etc., in the valley as a criterion, it would show the tribe to have been the inferiors intellectually of the Eastern races. If masonry flourished in Solomon's time, then the Aztecs must have had some connection with the races of Solomon's country. Okay. All right. Do you hear that? What's the true promised land? All right. We're talking about the Mexica. Mexi. Moshe. Mexi. Moshe. Moses. Mexica. Mexico. 
Dodge the hijack with Aztec. That's not their name. Mexica. Have some connection with what? The races of Solomon's country? Really? Oh. Still, it is only hypothesis and food for the scientists to reflect over the discovery of Masonic emblems in the ruins of the Aztecs. All right. Phoenix Republican. 1896. All right, all right. So since we're talking about masonry, right, and whether or not it was in ancient America, I'm going to show you what the masons say themselves, where it originated. They're going to tell you straight up. We're going to see how they say it originated, and the credit must be given to America, all right? I'm in the book Ancient Mystic Oriental Masonry. It's teachings, rules, laws, and present usages which govern and the order at the present day true masonry and the universal brotherhood of man are one all right by dr r swinburne climber author of the rosy crucians their teachings the philosophy of fire all right this is deep this is deep stuff right here so we go to page 25 of this book right and we go to this second paragraph right here let me zoom in now listen to what it says the cradle of symbolism used in all masonry all right. Remember, they found the square and the compass, the square and the circle, and all these Masonic relics, these artifacts, prehistoric in America and California and Arizona and all these places, all over the place. All right. These symbols, right? Symbolism, the symbolism used in all Masonry is placed by many of the best authorities in that country, which they believe was first inhabited. For example, the Plateau of Tartary. And from there transmitted to this generation by the sages of India, Persia, Ethiopia, and Egypt. Now look what he's going to say right here. He says, We are not indebted to either ancient Egypt for either religion or masonry, but to America. All right, so who, who gets the credit? You owe the credit to who? To America. For what? Religion and, or masonry? America. Yeah, unfortunately, religion too, right? Or spiritualism. We are not indebted to either ancient Egypt for either religion or masonry, but to America. Listen to this. It is a fact that at Memphis, Egypt, the real one, the real one, Mississippi and the pyramids, the mounds, the pyramids under the guidance of the kings, the mystic rites of masonry were worked many thousands of years ago. But at that time, Egypt, and the continent of America. Again, but at that time, Egypt and the continent of America were one and the same. Were one and the same. Okay, it is the same. America, Egypt is the same. They're telling you right here who, who is to be credited with masonry. America. America. At that time, Egypt and the continent of America were one and the same. These are Masons telling you. And America, rediscovered in the 15th century and repopulated in the 17th, was recovered Egypt. All right, they recovered what? The real Egypt or Tamari. They recovered. And the promised land. They recovered the promised land. So when they're saying Phoenicians coming out of over there, Israel. Israel is not a location. Israel was a people. Israel was a family, like saying the Johnsons, the Israelites. Yeah, J that's Jacob's kids. It wasn't a landmass. You can't say the Phoenicians came out of Israel. That's that's not even right. <laughs> that don't even make sense. Because this is the true promised land. Anyways, the Masons are telling you right here. In America, they recovered what? Egypt and the promised land. Or the land of the constellation of the eagle. Isaiah, okay? Now, they're telling you, it keeps going, that something happened in America. And secondly, with the consequent wrecking of the continent of America, when the globe became involved in the consequences of this order of the skies, this order of the skies, what happened? Did the drug cons come after you? America, known to the mystics as what? A what? As what? Atlantis. I've been trying to tell you, this is Atlantis. It's not me saying it. Acts a mason with high degrees they'll tell you america known to the mystic as atlantis when this ruin befell was the seat of the greatest empire 
America, white, the seat of the greatest empire, and its irresistible armies were terrorizing all of Europe and Asia. All right, remember the Greeks? They were like, no, they're coming to get us. This was the greatest empire in America. The Masons know this. This is their book. Continuing, when following the course of the constellations, those immovably and perpetually fastened upon America reached, it will appear that while all that is sublime in the historic past centers upon Egypt, all that is sublime in the prehistoric past centers upon America, Atlantis. Okay? Atlantis. And as the current which has hitherto concealed the prehistoric connection between the peoples of ancient Egypt and of America is lifted, it will be seen that the people of the eagle on the Nile being descended from the original people of the eagle on this continent, they are descended from us over here. It's not the other way around. The twain are one in that prehistoric America was the original Egypt. Again, again, that prehistoric America was the original Egypt. Egypt or Eagle Land prior to the mighty dispensation, the days of Peleg, all right, when the lands were separated, when the earth was divided and the great globe itself was nearly rent asunder. What did Agassiz says? Remember what Agassiz says, the most famous geologist. We got this already in previous past videos. Says Agassiz, first born among the continents, America has been falsely, has been falsely denominated the new world, has been falsely it's not a new world it's the old world hers was the first dry land lifted out of the waters first land that came out of the primordial waters you understand that hers was the first shore washed by the ocean that enveloped all the earth beside and while europe was represented only by islands rising here and there above the sea america or atlantis already stretched in an unbroken line of land from nova scotia to the far west America was evidently people from the old continent, from the old world, all right? Just to be clear, masonry did start over here. That's why they're finding those symbols over here. It's not a debate, okay? And it's not about Phoenicians coming over. What is a Phoenician? Phony, phen, phen, phony, phony, Phoenician, phony. That's not their name. It's a bunch of people, which includes also Danites, that's why Ireland plays a big role in this. The British Isles in Ireland, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to the Chaldeans, right? The Druids, we got already, right? Ireland, or of the Chaldees or Chaldees. The Druids are the magicians, are the Chaldeans. That is where Abraham came out of. And then he came back to the promised land over here. And we continue waking up with analog. Mom is in Tennessee, Georgia, 1892. They were found in a cave and are similar to those of Egypt. Again, they were found in a cave. We're talking about Tennessee, right? We're talking about mummies being found in Tennessee. Similar to those of Egypt. That is Egypt. Little Egypt. That is Tamari. Chattanooga, December 2nd. Two prominent citizens of London County, Tennessee. While hunting in the mountains, discovered a cave containing well-preserved mummies similar in every respect to those of Egypt and a large trunk or case bound with brass sealed in several places. Upon being opened, it was found to contain several leather cases also sealed. The largest was open and a roll of parchment found covered with Hebrew characters, Hebrew, Paleo-Hebrew, Phoenician, that's what they call so-called Phoenician, Hebrew, Paleo, the relics were deposited in the vault of the First National Bank of London. All right. You see, they had it. And the Smithsonian Institution notified. Oh, no wonder we didn't find out about this. Because they notified the Smithsonian Institute. And you know what they do, guys. They just hide everything. Reverend Dr. Tucker, pastor of the Presbyterian Church, translated one of the manuscripts and finds it to have been written by Menkara, high priest of the land of Kem. Do you guys hear that? Who wrote it? Menkara. He signed it. Where was Menkara living then? He was in Tennessee in ancient times. He wasn't over there. It was written by Menkara, the high priest of the land of Kemp. All right. It was over here in Tennessee. Who is Menkara? 
All right, Mankata. Mom, you have Mankata, high priest of Egypt, found in Tennessee. Mankata. He was a pharaoh of the fourth dynasty during the Old Kingdom who was well known under his Hellenized names, Miskerinos, Herodotus, and Mankedes. By Monero, according to Monero, he was the throne successor of King Bikedes. But according to archaeological evidence, he was almost certainly the successor of Khafre. Africanus from Sincelus <laughs> reports as rulers of the fourth dynasty, Soros, Sufis, the first, Sufis, the second, Mekedis. All right, that's him right there, they're saying. Menkadi became famous for his tomb, the Pyramid of Menkadi, at Giza, his statue triads. All right, to touch the hijack, so this is a statue of him, supposedly. Did they steal this from America, or did they just make a replica? Did they just make a replica? Did they bring this from over here? We on to you. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, right? Let's continue reading. It says, it contains reference to hidden treasures, which the writer says will be needed for a great war. The story is stranger than writer Haggard's most visionary efforts. All right? They found mummies. That's probably Mankara himself. They found mummies in Tennessee, just like the Egyptian ones, the same exact way. They're not telling you different. So why would you assume, why are you going to conjecture that all that happened over there only? We know to marry, to marry the beloved land that's right here. The Nile is the Mississippi. Correlating with exactly what the Masons said, right? What did the Masons say? That this is the original Egypt. All right. This is just more proof right here with the newspaper article. That's here. The lost worlds of ancient America, compelling evidence of ancient immigrants, lost technologies, and places of power. Edited by Frank Joseph, forward by John DeSalvo. Another California monolith is better known, but hardly less revealing of foreign travelers to our continent in prehistory. Standing alone on the side of a boulder strewn mountain, one of America's most perfect works of ancient rock art faces a broad valley just west from the town of Hemet. Some 90 miles southeast of the Los Angeles Ashtart monolith, a massive gray egg-shaped stone is emblazoned with the intricate design of a labyrinthine maze enclosed in a 3.5-foot square. Although rarely visited, the large image is surrounded by a metal fence top of a barbed wire in the center of a 5.75-acre public preserve set up more than 40 years ago known as the Maze Stone County Park. Even so, few Americans are aware of its existence. All right, so real quick, this is what they're talking about right here. All right, you see they got this pictograph right here, prehistoric. And you see all these boulders? Wow, look at this place. So much going on here. All right, so this is what they're talking about. This is what he was saying about it being fen fenced in and barbed wire and all that. Okay. Just want to read this right here. It says maze stone. This pictograph representing a maze is an outstanding example of the work of prehistoric people. It, with 5.75 acres of land, was donated to Riverside County as County Park on April 16, 1956 by Mr. and Mrs. Roger E. Miller. Uh, Miller. All right, so prehistoric. All right, prehistoric. Let's go back to the book. The anciently illustrated boulder is covered with a light patina referred to by locals as desert varnish. This results from a process of natural oxidation and may be used for dating the maze someday. After scientists are able to more precisely evaluate the percentage of change in mineral elements laid down on hard surfaces over time. Desert varnish likewise appears within the carbon itself, although to a lesser extent than occurs over the rest of the boulder, which, which geologists estimate has been exposed in its present location after tumbling down from higher up the mountain about 15,000 years ago. 15,000 years ago. The maze is actually a swastika, okay? They say swastika, and we know... This symbol was over here, like the cross and all that, before any religions, before they told us what it meant, before anybody grabbed it, like Germans, you know. It was a symbol known to numerous American Indian tribes across the continent from at least Hope William times. 
beginning around 200 BC when some of the earliest surviving examples were made of copper. What it meant to these prehistoric people has not come down to us, but the modern day Hopi preserve among their most important oral traditions an account of ancestral origins from a great flood that practically annihilated mankind. They believe that relatively few survivors migrated from the eastern location of the deluge, finally setting in the American Southwest. Hmm. To the Hopi, this mass migration of their grandfathers is signified by the counterclockwise hook cross, signifying the mass migration of their ancestors from the east. All right, so you guys hear that? So they're saying the Hopi, there was a great deluge and a lot of the survivors migrated to the southwest from the east coast. All right, from the east coast and the northeast. Whether or not it's the same symbolism that motivated the ancient carvers of the hem and maze is not known. But whatever it represents, it must have stood for something of real importance to merit such high artistic efforts. To say nothing of its prominent placement on a mountainside, clearly it was originally meant to be seen and appreciated by many people. Got a picture here that says of California archaeologist William Donato at the Hammett May Stone. Outstanding art as the Hammett petroglyph may be, it is neither the only nor the largest though perhaps the most finely executed of its kind in Southern California. There are actually several other stone mazes in the immediate vicinity. Something similar in nearby Ramona was accidentally found by hikers in 1977 after heavy rains exposed the design. They took it to San Jacinto Town Hall, where it was displayed until politicians ignorant of what else to do with the discovery presented it to gracious, if perplexed, tribal leaders of the neighboring Sabota Indians who continue to preserve the maze as their heirloom of a distant past of which they know nothing. They know nothing of this, right? So is it really theirs? So far, about 50 maze stones have been identified throughout Orange, Riverside, Imperial, and San Diego, all right? 50 maze stones in these places right here. At least 14 examples of labyrinthine rock art are known in a remote area of Palm Springs, contributing to their mystery all of them have been found within 150 miles of each other and virtually every one is rectangular although varying in size from four inches to several feet in diameter they are invariably located on mountain sites remarkably alike in their boulder dotted settings here too hopi myth seems to fit the evidence because the flood story recounts that as the waters rose to cover the ancestral island its residents climb mountain sites to escape drowning. All right. And you find this story around the world. The largest and most intricate design occurs 10 miles north of Hemet. As an example of the dark age mentality abroad in our land, the magnificent four foot square relic was partially obliterated by four shotgun blasts in the early 1960s. But enough of it survived to yield faint traces of red mineral-based paint that originally filled the glyph. Subsequent investigation of other maze carvings showed they likewise bore hints in varying degrees of red paint, an important discovery that may assist further in dating their creation, at least relative to each other. The less obvious the presence of red paint, the older the petroglyph. The hemistone evidences no indication of red, so it was either never painted or it is the oldest maze its pain having been weathered away over time. In the Hopi crown dance, the flood is recounted by a chief speaker who begins, I remember the old red land, the birthplace of his ancestors before it went under the waves. Every Indian tribe recounted its own version of a global inundation and the flight of ancestral survivors from the east over the Atlantic Ocean. Remarkably, this foundation myth was not imported along with the proselytizing efforts of 16th through 19th century Christian missionaries, but predated their arrival by unknown generations. Accordingly, Native American recollection of the cataclysm did not originate in the biblical Genesis, although both share some details. Interestingly, as the swastika signified North American Hopi predecessor migration from that catastrophe, the hooked cross was likewise a symbol of pre-Columbian Mexico's Chalchihuatlicu, 
the Aztec goddess of the deluge. Her myth told how she changes victims into fish, the same transformation recounted by the flood myths of the Babylonians and American Lakota Sioux. Chalchiutliku, Our Lady of the Turquoise Skirt, a reference to the sea, was commemorated during an annual ceremony in which priests collected reeds, dried them out, then placed them inside her shrine. As writing utensils, the reeds symbolize wisdom, for which her lost overseas homeland, the place of reeds, was renowned as Aslan. The place of reeds, Red River, the red, the reeds river, or the Red River, Colorado. What are we talking about here? Phonetic and mythic resemblances to the Greek Atlantis are inescapable. Indeed, temples are represented Chalchiutliku, seated on a throne surrounded by men and women drowning in a huge whirlpools. Perhaps California's formerly red mesas were meant to preserve the same tradition as ceremonial markers for ritual pilgrimages and imitation of a great migration from some natural disaster undertaken by its survivors. And we continue waking up with analog. It says here, science hunts out details of a lost continent. All right, so this is uh, just one page. I was able to find the actual, oh, well, in articles, pretty much talking about the same thing here from the Center for Bibliographical Studies and Research, UCRSS. This is from the San Jose Mercury News, 1919, December 27. It says, scientists seek lost continent. Bridge of land between South America and Hawaii, long submerged, all right? A bridge that connects Hawaii and South America. Professor of geology now carrying on remarkable search on ocean. Buenos Aires, December 26, details of a lost continent in the Pacific Ocean. A 6,000 mile prehistoric bridge of land between South America and Hawaii. Okay, do you hear that's connected to Atlantis? Yeah, Atlantis. Hawaii is connected to Atlantis. Yes, America. South America, specifically a land bridge, long submerged, is being sought by an American scientist, William Allison Bryan, professor of zoology and geology in the College of Hawaii, who left Honolulu last June of his remarkable quest. Dr. Bryan, who came to Argentina by way of Mexico and the west coast of South America, where he studied volcanoes and Andean geology, is about to return to Valparaíso, where he will board a ship for the little island of Juan Fernández, 400 miles out. The island is inhabited by a small colony of fishermen and their families. There is a continent under there, and it connects to what? To America. This is what I've been trying to tell you. Not all of it sank. Yes, a lot sank, but not all of it. The Masons told you this is... Known to the missus, this is Atlantis. That is a Nahuatl word, ATL. And we continue, and we're just talking about giants riding giants. Say, what? This is from Nevada, 1869. And it says here Nevada, petrifications and fossils. It is not a little whimsical to notice that. Since that little 10-foot stone man was dug up at Cardiff, which is creating such a sensation among the New York Yankees, there are plenty more suddenly resurrected down in the Arizona and in various other parts of the country, compared with which the Cardiff giant is a mere tom-tom, all right? They're talking about, hey, you know how we found that giant in Cardiff, you know? Well, that ain't nothing. There's a lot more all over the country. And a lot bigger. Over in Calaveras. I remember my Calaveras video. The Calaveras skull. Over in Calaveras County, California. Huge petrified skeletons of men are said to be quite common. Also the bones of yet huger animals. On which they used to ride. Do you hear this? They used to ride what? Huge animals? Are you talking about a dracon? Judging from the saddles. As large as dump carts found still strapped on their backs do you hear that they're finding giants riding giant animals with saddles still on their backs they never told us they found all these things right that's amazing 
We helped to dig up a thigh bone ourselves over there, 15 feet long, which doubtless belonged to some antediluvian chief. All right, a chief, a giant's thigh bone, an antediluvian, right? America's a true old world. Some called it an old log, but it was the shape of a thigh bone, anyhow, and badly petrified. All right, petrified, just like the Calavera skull, man. We have never known many complete stone giants to be exhumed in this vicinity, but out in the humble country, one large body over a hundred feet long, a hundred feet long, you guys hear this? Known as the little giant has been found completely petrified into quartz and silver ore. It became crystal. All right, and it keeps going there, but that's the article right here. Wow, petrified giants riding giants. We continue here. We got an article from 1894 regarding the Melungeons of Tennessee. The Melungeons, a strange people who live in the mountains of Tennessee. It is not generally known that in the mountains of eastern Tennessee, there lives a class of peculiar looking people whose origin is wrapped in mystery and who are called by the white Melungeons. The legend of their history, which they carefully preserve, all right, they had the genealogy preserve, is this. A great many years ago, these mountains were settled by a society of Portuguese adventurers, right? I want you guys to really think about what they're saying here. Those are the Sephardic Jews, the Moors that were being kicked out of Spain during the Inquisition. These are people of color, so-called Negro people as well, black Europeans. All right, these so-called adventurers, these pirates, these adventurers, these colonists, explorers, whatever you want to call them, merchants, trademen, navigators, men and women who came from the shore of Virginia, that they might be freed from the restraints and drawbacks imposed upon them by any form of government, all right? They were being forced to be, what, indentured servants and work and, you know, pay this tax and all that. They just wanted that freedom, right? Freedmen. They wanted to be freedmen, right? They made themselves friendly with the Indians. So what did they do? They made themselves friendly. <laughs> friendly with the Indians. Hey, let's get friendly, and freed as they were from every kind of social government. They were freedmen, literally. They uprooted all conventional forms of society and lived in a kind of delightful utopia of their own creation, trampling upon the marriage relation, despising all forms of religion and subsisting upon corn, the only possible product of the soil and the game of the great forest. They intermixed with the Indians, again, they intermixed with the Indians, who? Portuguese adventurers. We're talking about Sephardic Jews and Moors. Moors. Moorish. Moorish. Yes. Mixing with who? The Indians became very friendly. And subsequently with the so-called Negroes. What Negroes? These are so-called Negroes, the Portuguese and the Indians. You see, Dr. the hijack. They're just trying to add that in there because they know these are people of color and thus form the present race of Melungeons. They are tall, straight, well-formed people of a dark copper color, copper color tribes of America, dark copper color, but with Circassian features. Circassian features, yes, black Europeans. They were privileged voters in the old slave days and accredited citizens. They are brave but quarrelsome and are hospitable to strangers. They have no preachers among them and are almost without any knowledge of a supreme being. They marry by established forms, but husband and wife can separate at pleasure without meeting with any reproach or disgrace from their friends. They have but little association with their neighbors and are in every respect save that they are under the jurisdiction of the state government, a separate and distinct people. All right, Melungeons or Mixed, right? Melungeon, French word. We're waking up with analog, and there's nothing new under the sun. All right, we're going to read this uh, article from North Carolina, 1839. From 1839. Nothing new under the sun. Only think, mummies found on this North American continent of ours. Mummies, exactly like those of Egypt, all right? Again, are the Masons 
making it up when they're writing in their sacred books and teaching their initiates and all that and that this is the true eight the original Egypt this is where you find the promised land Atlantis are they lying and then they're finding mummies and all this stuff around here that they never told you about Christopher Columbus is not so great of a hero after all a bold navigator and all that but it seems he was mistaken when he supposed he had found a new world all right <laughs> yeah he was very mistaken he knew where he was coming he didn't never said that he knew where he was going he was sent over here he met indians in ireland in the 1470s he knew about the navigational stories of he knew there was trade going on anciently back and forth he knew this was atlantis he knew this was the promised land read the notice of dr hawks lecture below he is a native of our state and does her honor. Dr. Hawks delivered his lecture on Wednesday evening on the Antiquities of America to a crowded room at the Stuyvesant Institute and illustrated his remarks by transparent drawings prepared for the occasion. He first exhibited drawings of mounds, walls, etc., etc., in several parts of the Western states, interesting only as exhibiting a link in the chain of testimony and then proceeded to exhibit drawings representing ruins in Mexico and Central America. The audience listened with respectful attention. Some appeared to be quite interested, but there was an absence of all extraordinary surprise or enthusiasm. Not a man belonging to the Institute of France would have been able to have kept his seat. And having the evidences clearly placed before him, which at once overthrows and unsettles all the theories respecting the discovery of America, listen, and proves uncontestably that we are in the old world. All right? It's not me saying it. Listen to this. I can't make this up. Yo, waking up with Anla, we cannot make this up. Once you see the overwhelming evidence, all right, that is placed before you, Respecting the discovery of America, it proves uncontestably that we are the old world. I've been telling you, shout out to Drop Nation. And not in a country discovered but a few centuries ago. It goes further and throws a new light upon the Bible and prophecies. The only true historical record we have to guide us in such matters. It was impossible to look at the pyramids and the drawings of ruins in Central America recently made by Mr. Walbeck, together with the glyph, the myriads of stone tortoises, the figures of Isis and Osiris, the palm leaf, the serpents, the heavy stone work, and the various basal relievos, without being satisfied that these were the works and labors of the very same architects who originally built Thebes and Memphis. All right, Memphis is right here in Tennessee. In our long we hope to have a champollion with us and the deciphering of the hieroglyphics and the true ancient history of this country all right the true ancient history of this in the americas all right you guys hearing like everything we've learned on this channel right he's just confirming it once you really start deciphering the hieroglyphics and the true ancient history of this country will be made known all right, Dr. Hawks deserves great credit for his laborious research and his lucid views on this subject. He is a pioneer of a great work. A new era is opening in the history of our country. A new era is opening right now, guys. It was supposed to happen in the 1800s. 1839, they wrote this. 1839, that's almost 200 years ago. Almost. He says a new era, and what happened? What happened? All of a sudden, everything's in Africa, right? But right now, a new era is open in the history of our country, an era in which we shall have extraordinary developments of the past and wonderful events for the future. And I believe that right now. Let's make it happen. Because there's nothing new under the sun. Much love and respect. Thanks for tuning in again. Hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. Look how it all comes together. Nothing new under the sun. A wow. I feel nauseous, believe me. Never had a lot of shit come easy. Had to work hard, struggle just to be me. Had to rise up just so they could see me.
did what I had to do just to feed me And what was left over I put towards my dreaming But the only thing in life that has meaning Are the things you gotta work for, believe me Take into your hands a plan Your own hands can land your own brand And damn, I feel like no one takes accountability They want the credibility Convincingly unwilling to put in the fucking hours It takes to get some power Don't be fucking sour Take a cold shower Scream until you're louder Work until you're prouder And fuck all the doubters They're just yeah. fucking downers I swear to God they all let me down I always fought just to wear the crown I'm pissed off at these fucking clowns Who were all taught they deserve an ounce It's only worth it if you work for it It's only worth it if you work for it I won't stop till they hear me now I won't stop till I wear the crown Till I wear the crown I swear to God they don't let me 